The Tuffle Commute, Season 2, Episode 4, Photocopies, in which we discuss English teachers and photocopiers, things we hate about photocopiers, the history of the photocopier, and a whole bunch of other stuff relating to perhaps the English teacher's favorite bit of technology. Let's get started. <laughs> You're listening to the Tefl Commute Podcast. What's the photocopy policy at your school? Um, for it to break as soon as anyone needs it. Um, no, I guess uh, we don't have a very strict policy. Uh, we have the photocopier set up so that it's automatically on black and white and all the teachers know that they have to have a real reason to do colour copying. Uh, we don't have any special codes for particular teachers, um, although we do keep a track on how much is photocopied on a monthly basis, um, and we have a go at teachers if it gets higher than, than the previous quarter, for example. What is the photocopy policy at your school? Okay, at our school, we, each teacher has a, a password, uh, so we can um, keep an eye on how many photocopies each teacher uses. In saying that, there's no limit as such, um, although we try to keep an, um, we're trying to minimise and reduce uh, paper waste, because it is seen as a cost to the school. And what's the photocopy policy at your school? Well, as teachers or doctors, we can just go in and just photocopy whenever we want without having to ask administration or we don't really need a password or a key or anything. That's it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Temple Commute, a podcast for language teachers that is not about language teaching, but the topic will surely come up. My name is Lindsay Clanfield, and today I'm not joined by my regular co-host, Sean Wilden. I'm joined by another one of our, um, actually, regular contributors, but now she's sitting in the co-host seat. Carrie Hannon, <laughs> welcome to the show. Hi, it's Lindsay. Thanks for having me. <laughs> this episode is all going to be about photocopies. Um, I was thinking, are the photocopy and the photocopier, it's such an English teacher thing. You know, it's such a staple, such a part. When I think of my professional life, it's such a part of my life. I wonder, though, do you think, Carrie, that this is something that's characteristic of all teachers or is it English teachers in particular? Are we more guilty of having this love-hate relationship with the photocopier than other teachers? I don't think so. You know, because there's been, like, I can remember history teachers who'd have reams and reams of handouts in class. And, um, like, you know, sort of, I was looking at notices about photocopying um, laws and stuff, you know, sort of in a university library. And it seemed to just apply to absolutely everybody. I don't think it, well, maybe, maybe we're more guilty of that kind of cut and paste, copy, handout kind of thing. I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. I, I, I sometimes wonder, I mean, when I hear you just saying that about the history teacher and the reams of copies, and I suppose when I think of back in high school, I always had photocopies from for most of my subjects. I mean, math worksheets as well was very common. Is it perhaps also because language teachers we feel, is there a certain guilt, maybe more guilt that we feel about photocopies? Or is that just because I read too much about dogma? <laughs> I don't know, but I know that in my kids' schools, for example, things are like the printing now falls to the parents, not the school. So they're kind of getting around this whole photocopying thing, right? It's all online and we're the ones who are paying for the ink. There's quite a lot of, you know, upset parents who are saying that the physics teacher makes us print out too many handouts. I think it might just be passed on from one machine to another. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe it's all teachers then. Maybe the photocopier is the best thing that happened to teachers, but also the worst thing that happened to teachers. <laughs> how do you, uh, how, what's your personal photocopy um, policy, Carrie, as a teacher? Do you go for more than you need? Do you avoid copies altogether? What do you do? 
zero if possible. It's kind of like this, it, it's like minimal packing, you know, where you want to travel as light as possible. And I guess kind of like a teacher, I want to try and travel as light as possible as well and, and not go anywhere near the photocopier if possible. I taught one course recently for three months and we just used one photocopied text in the whole three months. And I was kind of like, you know, I came out feeling really proud of that. But um, there's a lot of other stuff obviously you need to prepare around it to be able to sidestep the photocopier on the way into class that's true that's true here's another question then you have a class of if you had a class of 16 students of which usually 12 came on a regular basis and that day you had to make a photocopy of something for them how many copies are you going to run off hmm. uh 10 <laughs> yeah, they could share. They could share between two, and there'll be a couple left over for people who didn't turn up. Yeah, I don't know. I'm thinking of my own photocopy things. I, I would usually go under, and then when it goes wrong, I'll suddenly get frustrated. In the next class, if I have copies, I'll give extra. But I, I have colleagues who go way over. So their class is 16. They'll run off 20, uh, quote unquote, just in case. <laughs> just in case, like people drop by. <laughs> But even then, when I do, if I had 16 students and I made 16, invariably that day, seven will show up. And I know I'm supposed to keep the copies to give to the others, you know, when they come the next day, but I always forget, or I always leave them somewhere, or I, I lose them, or I end up just recycling them, so... Yeah, the recycling's kind of okay, isn't it? You know, sort of, if you've got a stack of recyclable worksheets that you can just pop into the photocopier next time round, but... It always takes takes a bit of discipline to do that as well, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I think we're getting into things that teachers hate about photocopiers. Um, <laughs> there was a very funny um, hashtag, photocopy fail, on Twitter. Um, and uh, I was just wondering, Carrie, do you have any stories of you things that you hate about photocopies and photocopiers or photocopy fail stories that you've had? Okay, so um, my my pet hate myself is that every time you go to a, a new staff room or you're, you know, you're teaching in a new office or you're going to another school or whatever, the photocopiers are never the same. You know, sort of, so there you are, you're like, you know, you're on top of your game at home, you're this kind of photocopying hero and, um, and then suddenly with a new photocopier and you have absolutely no idea how to do anything you know sort of and you just feel like oh god I'm a fool I have to go and ask someone to help me so that's my personal pet hate it's like um you need a degree in engineering now or 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 or, or robotics or something to figure out the little <laughs> yeah, screen like, and all, all the I millions of options yeah. one copy please you know no I don't want it double-sided I don't want it enlarged i don't want it you know so no just just give me a copy but my photocopy fails things tend to be over enlarging things whenever i try to get too clever and enlarging and i oh, either yes. make them smaller or there's just the the it just starts getting littered the the recycle box gets littered with all my failed attempts it's, it's horrendous they're embarrassing i always i always kind of bury those at the bottom of the recycling pile as well so it's kind of like i don't want to be associated with those kind of photocopy fails the my other one is failing to reset you know like you know someone else will have been doing something before you but instead of just resetting starting again and putting in your own settings you're in a rush you put in your copy and then suddenly it's copying 20 instead of one or as you say like it's copying enlarged or smaller or double-sided or whatever and it wasn't what you wanted and then you press that cancel button and it won't cancel and yeah those kind of flaps photocopy panics yes another photocopy fill i think for most people would be uh or I don't think it's just me, is not being able to figure out what, how to make the double-sided copy. Like it takes me <laughs> yeah. at least five <laughs> attempts, even on a photocopier I know really well, five attempts to get the, the double-sided right. So like the, like that, that, that you turn over the page and it looks right. It's not kind of upside down on one side or both. Oh, it's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah. Well, then you forget and then you get the same thing the same copy on both sides of the paper and then it's all out of sync and you have to start the whole job again, don't you? you know, so that, that is, that's definitely another one. I had one from a, um, I was asking in the staff room where, where I work here and it's like one of the teachers who's a perfectionist said that her pet hate was she didn't like to see the edges of the other pages. Ooh, okay. 
Oh, yes. Okay, now that, that's not such a problem for me, but I can understand people getting upset about that. <laughs> I think that it's also kind of brings something else out there about the what exactly are we photocopying? Because I think on the whole, I'm, I'm tending to photocopy stuff that I've prepared myself. So that edge of the page thing is when you're when you're photocopying from another another book, isn't it? Or maybe a magazine or whatever. But that that the edge of the page thing is when it's not actually your work. And some people at the at the top of the show, when we had um, some of those directors of studies talking about their policy, they were referencing that they were respecting copyright and they had to uh, have a control of copyright. Um, so they were very careful about that at their schools photocopying. I remember when I started teaching in Mexico, oh my God, there was no copyright, schmoppy right. I mean, <laughs> we were just co everybody copied everything, entire books. But now I think it's getting a lot stricter at the school. Uh, Carrie, you said you were looking into like copyright and photocopies. What should teachers know? Okay, so um, what we're allowed to do if we want to uh, make multiple copies um, for a class or whatever is that the institution that we're working for needs to pay for a photocopying license and they need to display that license at the photocopier. And, um, and then there's this kind of... Um, trust, I guess, that anybody who's photocopying is going to be following the rules of that license. The rules say that we can photocopy up to 5% of um, any publication or a whole chapter um, or, or a story or a poem, um, but uh, no more than that and only one per course. So you can't take two chapters from the same book on separate occasions. You can only have one per course. And um, apparently newspapers are completely different. We shouldn't really be photocopying newspapers at all. But there's this interesting little loophole that um, if you photocopied a very recent newspaper, then that's fine because you haven't had the time to ask for permission. So very, very recent publications, it seems there's this kind of grey area where, yeah, go ahead, because um, you wouldn't have been able to make it in time to ask for, for permissions anyway, but you can only do that once. You can't then make that your favourite handout for the next five years. Um, so kind of, you know, complicated and difficult to keep to all the rules, I think. Hmm, interesting. How old is the photocopier? Ah, how old do you think the photocopier is? Uh, okay, I would, I'd say that it's, it's going to be more than 50 years old. It is, yeah. Well, it'll be more than 50 years old. Um, okay, yeah. 60, 60 years old, <laughs> 70. <laughs> so it's got kind of, it's one of these long histories of the, apparently it was first invented or the first photocopy was made, the first dry photocopy, um, in 1938. But then it took until 1959 before the actual first photocopier came into use. And it, and it took the guy who invented it three years to get a patent, which was massively ironic because he actually worked in a patent office and and he he actually you know put his mind to inventing the photocopy because part of his work in the patent office was having to copy all the documents out by hand make carbon copies of them so like this whole process is really really slow even patenting his own photocopying machine was really really slow and it's one of those kind of you know um companies kicking themselves for having turned this guy away at the door when he came along with his wonderful idea and um and, and nobody wanted wanted to make it. Nobody believed that there was any use for photocopying until 1959. So the launch, the first launch was in 1959. So as you say, just over 50 years old. Okay. What was his name? Uh, his name was Chester F. Charlson. And um, as I say, he was working in a patent office. He was a graduate in physics and chemistry. And kind of one of the the interesting things, I think, is that he um, he suffered from arthritis, which made this part of his job of having to copy out all of these um, documents incredibly painful. So it was kind of like, you know, a real mission of his to um, get this photocopier to work. 
Okay, well there. What, so that's a little bit of trivia for uh, the English teachers uh, going to um, pub quizzes or something. Yeah. Oh, I have some more. Hold on. I'd, um, so the the first photocopier in 1959 was launched in a hotel lobby with a live TV launch, and the advert won the spot of the year. It was the people were just so excited about it, and um, but it had one drawback, which was they, they very often caught fire. And so maybe like once a month or something, they might burst into flames. Um, and so they came with their own extinguisher. So the first photocopiers were sold with packaged, packaged with their own fire extinguisher. That's fantastic. That's great. <laughs> I love that. We'll try to include a, uh, a link to that ad, I think, in the show notes, actually, if, there, if it's online somewhere. It is. It's on YouTube. It is. I was surprised to see that. It's incredibly boring and flat, you know, sort of uh, ad of the year. I think they should have launched it at a school. They should have, yeah, or a library. Yes, something like that. (laughs) Now it's time for some teaching wisdom from a Facebook meme. In teaching, you cannot see the fruit of a day's work. It is invisible. And remains so maybe for hmm, 20 years. Jacques Berlin. So um, I found this great little clip on um, on YouTube from um, from Mad Men um, talking about the the new photocopier in the offices. And um, here it is. I'm going to tell you this, and you can tell all your little friends. This is a delicate piece of machinery. You don't just shove paper in it. You don't bang on the buttons. You don't sit on the glass. If you want it to work, you have to treat it with respect. That's a great clip. It makes me think of of other signs that I've seen around photocopiers sort of saying how delicate they are, or or indeed of people sort of cajoling the photocopier, uh, praying, talking to it, trying to make it work. Have you ever heard or seen teachers doing that? I've heard lots of, um, coming back to our, our, our previous episode on uh, an earlier episode this season on explicit language, yeah. <laughs> certainly heard a lot of people swearing at the photocopiers, but also pleading sort of just like, please, please, uh, just, just, just this once. You know, or just get get enough toner to just get my copies out. Yeah, you don't get those um, posters at the photocopying machines. Um, one of my favourite is one that I find really, really difficult to pronounce. Okay, so bear with me, but it's um, it's like there's someone there jumping up and down, you know, hitting the machine, and the poster says, "Anthropomorphizing inanimate objects damages your mental health." And then, calm down, it's a photocopier, it can't hear you. Uh, um, that was that's one of my favourites. And then the other one, which seems to be the like number one favourite amongst teachers, is the Bob Marley one. Have you seen that one? No, what is it? Um, no copy, no cry? No, no, no. It, it's, uh, this printer is now called Bob Marley because it's always jamming. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> okay, okay that is a good one. That's a good one. Okay, I do like that one, yeah. Although my usual co-host, Sean, is not with us today, he's uh, still bringing us something from the famous Tefl Commute Desert Island. Sean, take us away. Welcome to the Desert Island. Yes, you heard that right. Desert Island. A section lovingly named after all the students who have had trouble sorting out their puddings from their side. Loosely based on an idea that the BBC had some years ago, we interview a person in ELT about things they would take with them if they suddenly had to go and teach on a remote island. And of course, we also find out what dessert they take with them to eat. So, welcome to the Desert Desert Island, uh, Christina. Everyone, today I'm talking to Christina Ribafay Broadus, the person who thinks we're creepy. In a good way, though. It's creepy, creepy in a good way. I mean, I like feeling like I'm driving around with you guys in my car when I'm listening to the podcast, uh, driving to work. Um, 
But at the same time, then I look around and realize, no, Sean's not sitting next to me. And Lindsay and James aren't in the back of my car. So um, some people obviously will know uh, who you are. Um, but this podcast mm-hmm. goes to a number of people. So right. do you want to just tell us who you are, where you're based, what you do? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm based in Grenoble, which is in the, the lovely French Alps. Uh, and so what I do is uh, I treat, I teach business English. Um, I work with, of course, French professionals. And also something I've recently started doing is um, a YouTube channel called Speak Better, Feel Great TV. Uh, the idea is that it helps people to speak better English and to feel more confident doing it. Um, I'm also the editor of the magazine of um, TESOL France, The Teaching Times, and just sort of normal everyday routine work. So that's it's me. Yeah, time for everyday normal routine work with all that going on. You're now going to be wafted away and dropped in the middle of a, a, a desert island. Um, and we asked you to choose a methodology book that you would take with you uh, to help you, to entertain you, uh, and mm. so on. Mm, okay, so a methodology book. Um, I'm actually, I don't think this is going to be very original because it's the same response that Sinead gave on her dessert island. Um, and I, w- I would probably take the Teaching Unplugged by Scott Thornberry and Luke Meddings. Um, just because for me, it was such, let's say, a, a pivotal book for my teaching career. Um, when I did my Delta experimental practice assignment, it was on dogma. And like there is a before the dogma and after dogma um, teaching that I've, I guess, that I practice. Um, and I would say thanks to that book and just thanks to reading about it and experimenting. Like now I'm totally okay with, you know, if, if the the company calls up and they says, oh, this other teacher's absent. Can you take over their class? It's in an hour. Um, and, and totally okay with it. So that has been just a big help in my teaching career. But I think it's like anything in ELT. You don't want to be all or nothing. I mean, I don't do every lesson is not a dogma lesson. It's like, you know, if somebody said, I'm going to only do Suggestopedia or I'm only going to do um, TPR. I mean, nobody does that. It, but it's a good, it's definitely something to have in your head uh, and something uh, to add to your toolbox. Fair enough. And uh, definitely handy when you're going to turn up on an island and you don't even know who the students are. So um, exactly. uh, emerging language would be um, uh, the way forward there, one would think. Yeah, 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 exactly. Maybe emerging survival <laughs> skills as well, yeah. you know. <laughs> So task-based learning dogma. Let's build a fire and look at the language we need. Exactly. Let's see who survives. And then, you know, the last student's left. Well, you get to uh, continue living. (laughs) That's very true. Okay, so that's the methodology book chosen. What about a resource book? Um, A resource book. You know, actually, it's... um, Actually, a really simple one, but I find that the um, the activities in it are, are very useful. I've used them lots of times, and students always enjoy them. Um, and it's the reward photocopiable um, pack. I don't remember the exact name of it, um, but it's reward series, and it's it's books of photocopiable activities and resources, and you have from elementary up to upper intermediate. Um, just resources. I mean, re- sometimes really classic things like, you know, the, the there is, there are. You've got two photos of a living room and you have to find the differences between the photos. Um, like this, but, there I, is no photocopier on the desert island of gold. Oh, right. There is no photocopier. So, okay. Um, <laughs> so it's fine right to choose the book. Or, <laughs> as if I can't make photocopies, right. So, um, <laughs> Of course, the third thing is something else to take you with, uh, take with you to help your teaching. Can it be a photocopier? Um, it would actually be a lifetime supply of post-its and note cards um, because the number of post-its that I go through in a week. Because you can just do so much with them. You can do put the words back in the correct order. You can do word associations. You can do translations. You can do matching games, um, brainstorming structures for presentations. I mean, the guy that invented post-it notes should like win a, a Nobel Prize or something for teaching. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm smiling because I'm just looking down at my desk at the moment, looking at how many post-it notes are all over uh, it. They're covered in post-its, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's how I keep... Um, 
keep reminding myself I've got to do something. Um, what dessert would you add to the repertoire of desserts that uh, Sinead and David have put on the island so far? Well, let's see. My my dessert that I would take to my dessert island would be um, my husband's tiramisu because he, he just makes like the... First of all, tiramisu is my favorite dessert in the entire world. Uh, and my husband makes a really good tiramisu. So I would... You, with my lifetime supply of post-its, a lifetime supply of my husband's tiramisu um, that I could just eat every day and then go swimming every day to work off all the calories and whatnot. <laughs> but on a desert island, I don't think you have to worry about things like, you know, eating too much. <laughs> I don't think eating too much is, is going to be a, is a real worry as well. So tiramisu um, gets taken onto the island. Okay, so let's put all those in a very big backpack, given that there are two lifetime time supplies. Pop, oh, right. pop your parachute on and uh, off, you, off you go and never I'll call us creepy again. Thanks very much for your time and yeah, uh, I you. look forward thank to seeing you in person again at some point in the future. Indeed, at a f- future conference. But in the meantime, I'm going to really just enjoy listening to your podcast because they're so great. Okay, speak soon. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Bye. <laughs> Did you have something else prepared about uh, uh, what was happening, like photocopiers and other inventions? Ah, yes, I have a little game for you, kind of um, following in Sean's footsteps a little bit, but I've kind of played with his timeline game. Okay, so I don't know if you know this before or after game. And the thing is that, you know, so, well, usually you play it with. So things that were invented, were they invented either before you were born or after you were born? But in this case, we're going to take the birth of the photocopier, okay? So we're taking 1959, and um, I'm going to give you like a list of um, different things, inventions, and you have to decide if they were invented before or after the photocopier. So the first one is the breathalyzer. Okay, just so uh, listeners can play along here as well. So again, what it is, is we're guessing if things came before or after the copy, photocopier. The breathalyzer, alcohol breathalyzer. The alcohol breathalyzer, that's right. Was that invented before or after the photocopier? After, after. I'm going to say after. No, <laughs> before. <laughs> the breathalyzer was invented in 1954, so just five years before. Okay, shall I give you um, another one? Go for it. Okay, what about um, fruit-flavoured yoghurt? Before or after? So that's surely before the photocopier. Fruit-flavoured yoghurt, it must have been around as long as people have been fruit and cows. So for, I'm going to say before. Well, from my research, it seems that it was actually after as a product that went on sale in shops. So fruit-flavoured yoghurt first went on sale in the UK in 1963. Wow, all right. That one surprised me as well. Okay, so let's go for something uh, equally trivial. What about um, Mr. Potato Head? You know Mr. Potato Head from the Toy game? Story? Yeah, the, ga- the, the yeah, toy, the, the little, little toy. toy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, I would say that would be after. Like that was a 1970s thing. I had one. I had one too. Yeah, and my kids have got one too. Now, okay, I've, sorry, caught you out again. That one was invented in 1952. Wow. Right. Do okay. you like one more? Let's go Should for one more. Have, Let's go. I'm going to go for double broke. Double, double or nothing. Double or nothing. Okay. So, um, I'm choosing from my list here. Okay. Would you like medical or transport? Transport. 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 Okay. The hovercraft. Okay, that's uh, that's the sixties. That's after. That's like James Bond. That's James Bond type stuff going. To, that's after. I'm gonna say after. Okay, no, <laughs> but it was only two months before the photocopier. So the first hovercraft crossing of the Channel was in July 1959. There you go. I tried to make it difficult. Okay, so I'm O for five or O for four. Great. <laughs> oh, Lindsay. By the way. Have you ever used one of those voice-activated photocopiers? Have you ever come across one of those? No. What does it work like with Siri or like one of these kind of voice things? You just talk to it and say? That's, yeah, that's the idea that you kind of go, you know, copy and 20 copies or whatever. Oh, so would it understand like 
make me 20 copies of this double-sided of pages 18 and 19, uh, uh, blowing it up by 120%? Well, now that's the theory, or at least that's the basis for an April Fool's prank that's been around for about three or four years now. And um, I've been looking at them on YouTube and you fell for it. I'd fall for it. I think this is like wonderful. This is you can actually um, you can go online and you can download printouts which are you know mocked up to look like they are from you know whichever company and 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 stick them up at the photocopying oh, machine. Oh, oh, put those on. Put put the links in the show. Put the links in the show. Let's yeah, see if people yeah, yes, definitely. Play that play that trick on play that trick on each other at schools. That'd be great. So that seems to be the number one photocopier prank that I managed to come across. Right, well, I think we're coming to the end of the episode. I just wanted to say thank you, Carrie, for coming and sharing all this information about photocopiers. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, and uh, Carrie will be back with us again for Carrie's Corner and occasional episodes. Uh, Sean has been away this week. He's on a special mission to Australia, uh, I believe, um, and uh, is, is keeping in touch with us from down under. But he will be back for more episodes uh, in next time. This was the Temple Commute. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. Goodbye now. Goodbye. As your commute is coming to an end, here's an activity you can take into class. Try a photocopy audit with your students. Ask them to keep all the photocopies you give them during a week or over a defined period of time. Do the same yourself, keeping a single copy of each photocopy you give the students. At the end of the week, ask them to take out the photocopies and review them. Do they think you gave them too many photocopies or not enough? Could they use less photocopies? Were there things they could share? What do they do with the copies? Are there some photocopies they found more useful than others? What were they? Then hold a discussion on what you think a good photocopy policy for the class should be. You can read more about this and find links and ideas for this episode to use in class at our website, www.tafflecommute.com. You've been listening to The Tavel Commute, an original podcast produced and presented by Lindsay Clanfield, Sean Walden, James Taylor, and featuring Kerry Jones. Don't miss out on any episodes by subscribing to us on iTunes or YouTube and by visiting us at www.tafflecommute.com.